My name is Dan Sitso, and we're, I'm a professor of atmospheric chemistry at MIT, and we're here today talking about climate change and geoengineering. Uh, climate change is, is now a rather settled science uh, in the sense that we've known about the addition of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to the Earth's atmosphere for a number of years. Uh, it's actually been known for over a hundred years. Uh, some of the first work on greenhouse gas warming uh, dates back to the 1850s when a pair of scientists, John Tyndall and uh, Svante Arrhenius, um, did the, the sort of seminal work, the first work on understanding how things like CO2 in our atmosphere could warm the climate. Uh, sunlight as it comes into the planet um, can be uh, can make it to the surface of the earth warm the earth up and then as a result the planet gives off some heat so that heat is then absorbed by these greenhouse gases in the in the Earth's atmosphere, and some of that heat is then transferred back to the surface of the planet. You can sort of think about it like a, a blanket on top of the planet, so that some of the heat that it's giving off that would otherwise make it to space makes it instead. Um, is, is transferred back to the planet and, and warms the planet. And so this is actually a good thing. Uh, if we didn't have greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, uh, the planet would be below zero degrees C, below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and it would be frozen. It would be a big snowball. And so we should be thankful that there's some greenhouse gases there. And thanks to Tyndall and Arrhenius, we, we understand this concept, and, and we have for some time now. The problem is that over the last few hundred years, really since the Industrial Revolution, we've been burning fossil fuels, we've been burning trees, we've been burning all kinds of different materials, um, and we've been putting CO2 into the atmosphere. We've also been emitting other greenhouse gases, uh, things like methane and nitrous oxide, which act in very much the same way. And so as these rise in our atmosphere, we see a corresponding rise in, in the temperature of the planet. And this has uh, been called everything from climate change to global warming, um, but the end result is the same, which is the planet is, is warmer now uh, than it has been in, in many thousands of years. Uh, and, and we have much more of these greenhouse gases. So uh, current estimates are that there's something more than 40% more CO2 in the atmosphere than before the Industrial Revolution started. And so um, that's not the whole story of climate change. Uh, there's other things that we as humans are doing to the atmosphere that are changing it. Um, one of the most important is something that, that we study in, in my group, uh, which is the human addition of particles to the atmosphere. And so uh, this is pretty easy to imagine if we were uh, any of us is commuting to work today, there was probably a, a big truck that went by and it was spewing some smoke out. And so it's easy to understand that, that we as humans are having this effect, we're putting particles into the atmosphere. Um, and so those particles act in a, in a very different way with respect to the solar energy that's coming into the planet. Um, most of the particles that we as humans are putting into the atmosphere reflect sunlight back into space. Uh, you can think of them acting sort of like a, a sunshade or an umbrella. Um, you know, if you were out sitting at the, at the beach during the summertime and you were getting a little too hot, you might put that umbrella out and it would reflect some sunlight back uh, away from you and you wouldn't warm up as a result. And so the particles that we're putting into the atmosphere do that. They also have a secondary effect, and that's that they act as the seeds on which clouds form. So if you go out today and you look at a cloud, um, you're seeing droplets or ice crystals in the atmosphere, and at the heart of each one of those droplets or ice crystals is an aerosol particle, one of these small particles. And uh, some of those droplets and ice crystals are, are there because they're forming on particles that we as humans put into the atmosphere. And so uh, those clouds, as anybody that's gone out on a cloudy day understands are going to reflect sunlight back into space before it strikes the planet. And so the planet as a result is not going to be as warm, it's not going to capture as much energy as a result. And so we have these two sort of competing factors. We have greenhouse gases that are warming and we have clouds and particles that are cooling. And the reason that we talk about global warming is because the greenhouse gases are winning out. We've put some particles into the atmosphere and created some clouds as a result, um, but they're not offsetting all of the global warming that's going on because of the greenhouse gases. And so we still have this imbalance, this warming. And um, we've actually been doing a reasonably good job of cleaning up particles uh, due to human emissions. Uh, we don't uh, nearly cause as much pollution now from particles as we used to. Um, and uh, we have not been doing the same thing with CO2. So CO2 is sort of rising. Particles are, are holding steady or even going down. And so we're seeing more and more and more warming as a, as a result. And so um, this is the world that we live in. Uh, we are already something like a degree warmer than we were before the Industrial Revolution. And we're probably locked into more than that already um, due to the CO2 that we're going to continue 
to emit into the atmosphere due to fossil fuel burning. Um, there's no prospect of really sort of turning off fossil fuel power plants or, or turning in all of our gasoline powered cars, um, airplanes or, or shipping in the next few years. So um, you can imagine that we're already locked into more warming uh, than we've talked about uh, already this, this one degree. And so um, when it comes to policy, uh, a lot of experts are talking about you not wanting to go over two degrees warming. And when I say two degrees, I'm talking about degrees Celsius. So degrees Fahrenheit, um, as we use in the United States, are, are something more than that. Um, and so, you know, policy experts want to sort of lock into to two degrees centigrade of warming. Um, we're probably already past that. We're, we're probably already locked into emitting more CO2 um, than is going to be sustainable at a, at a two degree level of warming. And so as a result, um, people have started talking about some of the options that we might have um, for, for drawing down that CO2 or for somehow altering, masking the temperature rise of the planet. And so uh, the term that has been used quite often is geoengineering. Uh, in some circles, it's not a very popular term, and I would agree with this because engineering has a certain amount of certainty to it. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, I think when, when we think about engineering, we think about solving a, a problem or, or, or making something um, where there's a high degree of certainty that it's going to have the desired outcome. And geoengineering is, is not that at the current time. Um, in, and so other people have started using terms um, such as uh, sequestration of carbon um, or managing solar radiation or changing albedo. And these are probably um, a, a not as, as catchy a phrase, but, but they're more correct. They're more correct for what we're trying to do. And so uh, geoengineering um, right now sort of falls into three broad categories. Um, the first one is a, a rather sound scientific idea, which is to find some way to capture the CO2 that we've already put into the atmosphere, um, to draw that amount of greenhouse gas down to a level that would have corresponded to something that we would have seen in, in pre-industrial times, go back to a climate that we've been in before. And so that's, that's one idea. Um, the other two ideas play off of this idea that we get this negative climate effect from particulate matter in the atmosphere and the clouds that they form. And so the other two ideas um, revolve around putting more particles, intentionally putting more particles into the atmosphere um, and trying to use them to reflect more solar radiation back into space thereby masking this, this temperature effect. And the other idea is to put particles into the atmosphere and try to make them form clouds so that we get more of these bright white clouds that reflect radiation back into space. And so in general, those are, are sort of the three major ideas that are out there for, for geoengineering at this time. And uh, this has become rather mainstream. Um, I think that you know, in the last few years, um, we, we've really become convinced in, in the United States that, that climate change is happening, um, that it is a problem, and it's something that we have to solve. And so uh, we've started to think about what these possible solutions could be. And so about a year ago, uh, the National Academy of Science, and so this is a, uh, a non-political body in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was actually first formed under the Lincoln administration to tackle some of the big challenges that we have as a nation um, and bring together groups of experts to understand them and to make recommendations. So uh, a couple of years ago, they, they convened a, a group, a committee, to look at geoengineering. And uh, they came up with uh, two reports, not just one, um, which is kind of odd. You, you normally think of writing reports, and, and you know, if somebody asks you for one, you don't give them two. For my students, it would be like me asking for one term paper and them turning in two. But they had a very good reason for wanting to do this. Um, and the reason is that they felt that carbon sequestration, trying to remove carbon from the atmosphere, was very, very different than trying to put something into the atmosphere to mask a temperature effect, either particles or, or clouds. And so they said, we're not going to give you one report, we're going to split it into two, and, and we're going to address sort of sequestration ideas on one hand, and, and we're going to address this idea of trying to change the reflectivity of the planet in, in the second report. And uh, it, in summary, they, they were very much more positive about the science of the CO2 sequestration. Um, the reason for that is that it, it represents something that we know has happened in the planet's history. Um, we have been able to measure the rise in CO2 in our atmosphere, and we've been able to see what that climate state 
is as the CO2 goes up in the atmosphere. And so as a result, they said that, that this is more of a sure thing, that if we start to find a way to draw down that CO2, um, we can think of ourselves as running down that CO2 ramp and running down that climate ramp back to where we were before. And so the ideas for how to sequester that carbon are, are varied, and some of them are actually already in place right now. Um, so they, they span from land management changes. For example, you could imagine growing more trees where there aren't trees, and those trees are largely made out of carbon, and they would be pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turning it into a, a sequestered form in the, in the form of those trees. Um, other ideas include trying to get more organic matter into soils. Um, modern farming practices tend to take carbon out of soils, which is then released into the atmosphere. Um, so, so ideas include trying to put that organic material back into soils, sequestering it that way. Probably the one that most people think about is sequestration of carbon by pulling CO2 out, whether it be at a power plant um, or just directly out of the atmosphere, and forcing it back down into the earth. So we remove natural gas from the earth all the time. We pull oil out. And so the idea would be if we burn that and we turn it into carbon dioxide, maybe at the power plant we can just pull that out of the, the stack and we'll force it back down in, into the, the, the ocean, um, into one of these gas reservoirs, or we'll force it back down into an oil well um, or something of that sort. And so this is actually already in place. Um, there's places where natural gas is being removed and, and, and used, but it comes along with a lot of carbon dioxide that it's trapped with. And that carbon dioxide is even now as we speak being pulled out and, and put back into the wells. And uh, so, so this is a technology that, that's really in place and something that we can sort of build on right now. So this was the first National Academy report. And uh, again, to, just to reiterate, they were very positive about this and, and the ideas that were there um, between land management changes um, and, and things like pulling CO2 out and, and putting it back down and trying to go back to an earlier state of our atmosphere, something that, that we know about. Um, the second report was much, much more speculative. And so this addressed this idea of, of geoengineering, um, something that's been more commonly or more, more currently been called solar radiation management. Um, so the implication here is that we somehow manage the amount of sunlight coming into our planet. The report actually didn't like any of these terms. They didn't like the certainty of engineering, and they didn't like the certainty that was associated with management. And so they, they termed this report albedo modification. Um, albedo is a term that we use for the brightness of our, our planet overall. And so um, the report just said that, that we're going to try to modify it, um, but tried to stay away from any certainty of, of what was going to happen. And so um, broadly speaking, uh, that report falls into the two categories of things that have been proposed. The first one, um, which is to put particulate matter into the atmosphere. The second one, which is to try to make artificial clouds. So. Um, both of them draw from lessons that we've learned uh, in our planet. And as I mentioned, um, as an atmospheric chemist, um, we do a lot of research in this area. Um, one of the reasons that we do a lot of research in this area is that it is so uncertain right now. Um, we don't know very well uh, what we as humans have done to our atmosphere in terms of adding particulate matter uh, and the effect that it's had on the radiative balance, the temperature of our planet. Um, we know even less about how those particles are forming clouds. Um, we are still in the infancy of understanding which particles are the best at forming different types of clouds, um, how they might change things like precipitation around the planet, and how those might then affect the radiative balance, the temperature of the planet as a result. And so um, these, these ideas of changing these things um, have tried to draw on natural examples from our past. Um, and one idea that has come about is to try to simulate volcanic eruptions. And so um, for those of, old, uh, of us old enough to remember, uh, we had things like the, the Mount Pinatubo eruption that occurred in the Philippines in the early 1990s. And uh, that material um, came out of the volcano and it was thrown into the next layer of the atmosphere above the one that we live in. We live in the, the troposphere, which is the one that's associated with the surface of the planet. The next layer up is the stratosphere. And so this material was lofted so high into the atmosphere, it made it into the stratosphere. And particles that make it into the stratosphere can stay there for a very long period of time, like a year. And so um, when those 
particles from Mount Pinatubo made it into the stratosphere, um, the temperature of the planet dropped as a result by something like a degree. Um, and the reason was that those particles were, were reflecting sunlight back into space. And there's very famous uh, incidents of this in, in human history. Uh, in the 1800s, Krakatoa went off, and we saw an even larger drop in, in the temperature of the, the planet. And so we've seen these through um, recorded and even before recorded history where we can see the temperature of the planet dropping as a result of, of these particulates. Um, so the, the report acknowledged that you know, this was the sort of you know, scientific basis for this idea of geoengineering. Um, but uh, the report, and I am rather skeptical of this because uh, volcanic eruptions are very different than what's being talked about now. Um, so what we're talking about now is, is somehow trying to put material into our stratosphere and then keep that material there, not for a year like a volcano might do, but for decades or perhaps centuries. And so uh, this is very different than a volcano. Having a sustained amount of material in the stratosphere is, is very different than the perturbations we've seen. And so um, the report is, is, is skeptical in the sense that it's, it hasn't really been proven what effect this would have on the planet. Um, moreover, um, there are problems that are associated with volcanic eruptions that, that we have even been able to, to measure since Mount Pinatubo. Um, one is that there was a, a huge destruction of ozone as a result of Mount Pinatubo. So as soon as you put this material into the stratosphere, uh, ozone, which we rely on to block highly energetic uh, rays from the sun of, from coming in um, and causing things like, like cancers um, w was chewed up as a result of these particulates being there, the chemistry that was going on. And so if we do this in, in the stratosphere, um, that is certainly going to be a result of, of putting particulate matter there. There are some studies that are going on right now trying to find if there might be a particle type uh, that, that wouldn't have this ozone destruction, um, but it hasn't been shown that, that, that there is anything, um, not definitively. Um, there's other problems, and uh, one of them is uh, that, that this simply would mask the temperature of the planet by reflecting sunlight going back into space. But it wouldn't address the other aspects of adding greenhouse gases such as CO2 to, to the atmosphere. So CO2 acts like an acid in the ocean. And so um, there's been a lot of studies on the increased acidification of the ocean because of this increase in CO2, the effect that it has on marine organisms, things like corals. And so if you're just simply masking temperature, you're ignoring these other effects of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, it's a bit like um, breaking your arm and, and taking an aspirin. Um, the aspirin might make you feel better in, in the short term, but it certainly doesn't do anything about the other aspects of your broken arm. And so um, the, the report notes this, and, and, and this is certainly going to be a big concern. Um, another thing that, that's a problem is that um, there's this implication that we have to get onto renewable energies, things like solar cells. And so if we start putting this material into the stratosphere, we start diffusing radiation. And what I mean by that is that the sunlight that's coming in is going to strike these little particles and be reflected off in all kinds of directions. We're, we're hoping that some of it goes into space so that it drops the temperature of the planet. But it means that sunlight doesn't come down to the surface directly. And that type of direct energy is what solar cells need to generate power. So this diffuse radiation that's going everywhere means that our ability to generate power through solar cells drops. So, so you're almost um, cutting off an alternative technology that you need to get away from fossil fuels um, with this, this effect of masking the temperature effect of the planet. And so there's, there's these reasons and there's many, many more as to why you would be very, very careful about trying to do this. And um, a, as a result, the report is, is notably skeptical about it. The other idea in this area is, is to not necessarily just put these particles into the Earth's stratosphere, but instead put particles into the troposphere, the, the part of the atmosphere that we live in, and try to generate more clouds. And again, just to, to say this again, um, anybody that's been out on a cloudy day knows that it's not going to be quite as hot. You don't get the sunburn that you do on, on, on a sunny day. Um, you certainly don't see the, the bright uh, sun coming in. And so you notice that some of the sun's energy is being reflected back into space. And so uh, the, the, the quote unquote natural uh, lesson that we've, we've learned this from uh, is something called ship tracks. 
And ship treks are this idea that ships go across the ocean and they put particles out of their smokestack. Um, and you can see from satellites that sometimes as they go across, there's these clouds that are being formed by those particles being put into the atmosphere. And so the idea here is that we could try to do something like make artificial clouds as a result of putting particulate matter into the atmosphere. And perhaps we'd try to do this in ocean areas um, away from, from people so that, that we wouldn't see this effect. Um, and so uh, these types of ideas have been bandied about. And uh, one of the things that the report is very skeptical about, and, and, and I am too, I, I should, should take credit for my own skepticism, is that um, when you change clouds, you are going to change the precipitation of the planet. And so for me personally, this is a non-starter. Um, so again, you're, you're simply trying to mask temperature. You're not going to do anything about greenhouse gases or ocean acidification. But now you're also talking about changing the precipitation that we see on the planet. And so what I mean by this is that if you start making clouds in regions that there weren't, they're going to change clouds and particles downstream. And so you could do things like create droughts in places that there weren't droughts before. And some of the modeling studies that have looked at this suggest that you might create droughts in places like the Amazon, um, which is one of the places where we help pull a lot of the CO2 out of the atmosphere naturally into the Amazon rainforest and create a lot of oxygen. And so um, that type of thing could go on. You, you could also create torrential floods in places that wouldn't normally get that much precipitation. And so by sort of playing with this thermostat, you're having a lot of other undesired effects. And uh, so I often think of, of some of the invasive species that, that we've used in our environment where we think that we know what we're doing, but we have these unintended consequences as a result. And so my, my parents have, have retired and they've moved away from the, the cold northern climate and, and they're in North Carolina now. And uh, one of the lessons that was learned in, in the American Southeast um, was with the kudzu vine. And so this was something that we thought of in, in the 1800s and into the 1900s as being this wonderful thing that, that animals like cattle would eat and it would protect the ground and avoid soil erosion. And what's actually happened is that unattended, um, it's grown completely out of control. And it's caused much, much more damage in terms of having to remove it than it ever did in terms of protecting soil or, or feeding cattle. And so this idea that we had um, back in the 1800s and early 1900s about the effect that would it would have um, was certainly true. Um, it was one aspect of it, but we didn't consider all of these other things. And it, when it comes to these ideas of, of changing solar radiation around the planet, I think that's the lesson that we really have to learn right now, which is that we think we understand one aspect of how we might change the thermostat of, of the planet with some future research. It, it remains, even that aspect of it remains highly uncertain at this point in time. But we think we understand one aspect of it, but we also already have this idea that there's many, many other aspects that that is going to propagate into, that it's going to have other things that it's going to change. The ozone level of the planet, the precipitation of the planet, where this particulate matter is going to go, if it's going to create pollution or health effects in, in some other location. We also know that it's not going to address other aspects of climate change, such as the increase in CO2, the acidification of the ocean. And so as a result, at this time, um, this is simply not something that, that we really should be exploring. Um, for me personally, and I think for a lot of scientists today, there are several non-starters here. Um, you can think of it as the side effects being much, much worse than the cure that we're proposing at this time. And so while the reports and I myself are rather positive when it comes to carbon sequestration, trying to draw carbon out and go back to an earlier climate state, Things like changing the particulate matter in the atmosphere or changing the clouds in the atmosphere are, are simply knobs that we should not be trying to mess with at this point in time. Um, we just simply don't know enough about not only the effect of doing that, but, but the side effects of doing that, which could be catastrophic. And so for those reasons, um, this, this committee at the National Academy separated this into two reports. Um, they recommended quite a bit of research and, and implementation in the, the sequestration case, um, but that we should do no more than study the second, the albedo modification, this idea of, of somehow trying to change sunlight coming into the planet at this time. And so I would be at this time fully in support of that. I, I think that you know we, we have some strategies to draw down CO2 um, and try to tackle this problem moving forward. 
Um, but at the same time, we should learn lessons from our own past. Uh, I mentioned this idea of, of invasive species or, or thinking that we were going to get one effect um, and getting something completely different, which could have been more harmful than what we were trying to do at the beginning. We need to keep that in mind. And in, in this case, especially when there's so many red flags, so many warning signs, so many things that, that this doesn't address, um, that we should be very, very skeptical about this idea of, of somehow trying to add particulate matter or clouds to the atmosphere. Methane is the second most important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. It is also the second greenhouse gas that we as humans are, are augmenting or increasing in the atmosphere. Um, the ideas behind carbon sequestration, CO2 sequestration, are mainly aimed at CO2 and not at methane. The good news about methane is that it has a shorter atmospheric lifetime than does CO2. So um, say that, that we put a lot of methane into the atmosphere right now. It's a very potent greenhouse gas. It's the second most important right now. Um, and we're going to see a temperature rise as a result. Um, the the quote-unquote good news about that is that it's removed rather rapidly. So it'll undergo a number of chemical reactions and that methane will go away in the course of some years. About 10 years is what's commonly thought right now. CO2, on the other hand, is much, much more of a problem. Um, CO2 has a much, much longer atmospheric lifetime, um, anywhere from hundreds to thousands of years for the effects of CO2 once it's emitted to go away. And so um, in, in the long run, in the hundreds of years time frame, which is the one that we're really concerned about, um, you know, in terms of melting ice caps and sea level rise and so on, CO2 is the bigger player. That's the one that we really, at this point in time, have to be worried about. And so uh, carbon dioxide used to be about 280 parts per million of the atmosphere, so 280 CO2 molecules per million uh, molecules. And um, right now, we've passed 400. And so we've gone from this 280 number to this 400 number. And so one of the aspects of climate change, the, the degree or more of temperature rise that we've already seen is because we went from 280 to 400. And so we are already locked into more than that. And the reason is that we don't have a switch that's going to turn off coal-fired power plants tomorrow. Um, we're not going to stop driving gasoline-powered cars or flying airplanes tomorrow. And so at least in the near term, before we completely go to renewable sources of energy, we are going to be emitting more CO2. Um, so we may go to 450 or 500 or 600 parts per million. And so that's going to lock us into a temperature rise of two or three or four degrees. There's some uncertainty in all of these numbers, and, and this is what we as atmospheric scientists are working on right now. Um, but the problem is there, that you have a lot more CO2 at some point in the very near future, double what we started with in pre-industrial times. And that CO2 is going to be in the atmosphere for hundreds or thousands of years. And so to avoid, again, things like sea level rise um, or polar caps melting, um, we need to find some way to draw down that CO2 to whatever level we as a civilization decide is acceptable. Um, we may decide that we want to go back to 280 parts per million and we want to climb it like it was in the year 1750 before the Industrial Revolution. We might decide that we're okay with where it is in 2016 at 400 parts per million and we're okay with the temperature that we've already got. We may be comfortable with a little bit more. Maybe we can go to 450. Um, that's for us as a civilization to decide. Um, but nonetheless, at some point in time, we're going to exceed that number. And we're almost certainly going to do it in the next few years. Whatever that, that degree of warming is that, that we're OK with as a society. And then we're going to have to start thinking about how we're going to pull that extra CO2 out of the atmosphere and where we're going to put it. And that's the reason that we need to consider sequestration.